What's going on, guys? Thank you for tuning in again to another Bond Department YouTube video. This is a special one. As you can see here, I have Mr. Lorenzo and Selmo from Omega Bond Watches. What is up, guy? What's up? I'm surprised it's taking this long for me to make it onto your YouTube. You've been on there, just but just in a different, you know, we've posted some podcasts and stuff on there before. This is like the official. Yeah. It always for... seems weird doing a Zoom, though, because I'm not like, you know, like filming, you know, I don't know. It's just weird. You have this cascading light coming down your screen. It looks like God's reaching down to you. Is it really, is it really bad or is it just this little piece right it's here? This little. Okay. Well, people are going to have to deal with it because I'm not <laughs> fucking moving. Um, so I had you on. I asked you to come on and you were kind enough to come on because I've been wanting to do a video about Goldeneye, the film and the game for quite some time. And the reason I asked you is because you and I both got introduced to James Bond because of the video game Goldeneye. But then of course, eventually that became the film and then the franchise, but this is going to be kind of like an ode to Goldeneye. So what I want to do first is do you remember at all your first experience with the game? Like, let's just start there. Do you remember the first time you ever played the game? Yeah, I actually do remember. And it's funny how it all came about. So I was nine years old and we had just moved to Maryland from California. And I had zero friends. I was in a brand new state, brand new neighborhood, brand new school. And I met some some kids in our neighborhood and so i remember them one day being like oh let's go play golden and i'm like what you know so in maryland you know they have basements and stuff they're finished so bring me over go down to their basement which was also a new experience for me because in california there's there was no basements right. where i lived right so went down into their basement and there was um a tv and you know the n64 and i don't uh, I don't remember if I had played N64 at that point. For I, This might have been my first time playing N64. Well, anyway, they pop in GoldenEye, and I'm just trying to, like, understand what's going on. You know, like, it's I just know it's a shooting game, and we're playing multiplayer, and it's the, the goal is, is to get as many kills as you can. So long story short, six hours later, I'm hooked. Like, I am just hooked right. on this game, you know? I didn't really understand the concept. I, I heard him saying like James Bond, James Bond. And I'm like, I don't know who this is. Like, whatever. It's cool. Yeah. So that was like my first introduction to the world of Bond at that point. Yeah. It's funny because with the game, I know that your first film was Tomorrow Never Dies, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. But what was your experience like when you went from the game to the film? Was it crazy to see something so? I I didn't know they were related. As funny as that is, I didn't. I mean, that I can recall. I don't remember that there was a connection between the two. Really? Like I, I okay. didn't get that. So you never really played campaign then. I didn't. Like I mean, I did, but I realized there was a movie once. I saw Tomorrow Never Dies. Maybe a few months later, I realized there was a movie Goldeneye. And at this point, I started, you know, understanding, you know, I'm, I, had, I we had moved to a different city in Maryland. And my neighbor there, he was like two years older than me. His name is Brandon. He like explained everything to me. He was right. like, oh, no, this is like a movie. So we ended up renting the movie. I ended up watching Goldeneye and I was like, holy shit. Like it all started making sense then, uh -huh. right? you know? Yeah. It's, it's funny. Cause my, my story is my, my dad came home one day from work and was like, Hey, I'm going to take you to Toys R Us. I'm going to buy you this thing. And this is, you can see it in another video of mine, which is all about this bad boy, um, that bad boy. But uh, he bought me the N64. I didn't even know what that was. And then I, I actually can't remember how I came into Goldeneye. I can't remember who introduced me to it. I actually also think it was like a neighbor, but like not a neighbor I was very close with, like not somebody I ended up growing up with. Um, and then I used to rent it all the time. And like my parents, neither of them are really like, you know, like, oh, it's T for teen, like, 
you know, none of they were never like that at all. They didn't they, they didn't follow the, the, the rating no, guidelines. They, no, they never did. And <clears throat> even like with with films, like I was watching like Beverly Hills Cop when I was like eight with my mom. She didn't care. But um what was weird was I would rent Goldeneye, like she would literally, my mom would take me to Blockbuster, I'd rent Goldeneye, I'd go home, I'd play it for an hour, and she'd be like, You shouldn't be playing that. And she would take she would take it, put it back in the and then she'd put it on top of the fridge. So I'd like crawl on the cabinet and grab it off the fridge and go play it again. I would, it's just like, it was weird. And then I used to like, con, like, cause with my dad's job, he would travel a lot or they would entertain customers or whatever. So if they weren't home, my parents, and I was staying like at my grandparents, I'd be like, Hey, you know, you can take me to Blockbuster. I want to rent. And, and of course my grandma didn't really didn't give a shit. Game, you got yeah. She's like, Oh, you want to play a fucking game? game? When they kill people in this <laughs> game? Good. I like that shit. Mm-hmm. But it, it, it's just I don't but that it was just like that game dominated my childhood but oh, 100% for once, years like oh, trying yeah. to like get all the achievements and be facility in less than two minutes like yeah yeah it was insane yeah but so once you did make the connection between the film and the game did that just like really broaden your horizons or you know because I know once I started making that connection and I was seeing him like literally like above the guy in the bathroom stall I was like this is incredible I mean they don't even make games like that today that are shot for shot like that Mm -hmm. you know I mean I know there's some differences of course but it's pretty damn spot on did that was that like completely unheard of to you yeah so that was the thing is like all the levels like it was weird like i didn't understand and they're there they did add in some like different levels like right. you know Surface. there's all the snow stuff is like non-existent yeah that that the siberia stuff and then the missile silo and then what else did they add and they did like the there was like, like bunker, one more all that like bunker, bunker stuff aztec yeah so basically it was a hybrid version of the movie, but it was like so like er, like the layout of everything was pretty much like the movie, which was that was right. cool. Right. But um, yeah, it, it it was funny because after I saw Tomorrow Never Dies and, and I saw Goldeneye and I and I played the game, there was like this tiny little hiatus where like I kind of was like, OK, cool. And like I started moving on to the next thing. You know, again, at this time, I'm like going into middle school, like there's other things going on. So it was like 99 and like, I remember Austin Powers coming out and all that. And everyone was like all hyped up over that. And I, I just was like, mm. I didn't really, I didn't understand that Austin Powers was a spoof of James right. Bond. Like I just right. thought it was funny as shit. And then the world's not enough came out. And then that was like, that was the first time I remember like seeing a trailer and being like, holy shit, I have to see this movie the day it comes out. Right. And so I think I was in seventh grade at that point. That sounds about right. Yeah, seventh grade. So me and like five friends, like, you know, guys and girls, we like went and saw this movie. Still in and Maryland at this time? Still in Maryland. So we went to like a seven o'clock showing on a Friday night. I remember it. We went to Regal. We went in. We ended up sitting in like the third row from the front because it was so packed. Yeah. And the movie was like going. And I remember... So my mom dropped all of us off. So she like picked everyone up and dropped us off. And then this other girl that came, her mom was supposed to pick us up and drop us off back home. So I forgot what time they told her. This is back in the day when you'd pick up the phone and call to listen to movie times. Like this is oh, like, yeah, yeah, holy yeah. shit. Like this is dating me right now. But yeah, I was, I was, uh, uh, anyway, back to the story. So we're watching the movie and then it's at the part where Bond jumps in and he's like, like, getting into the sub her mom's like outside and i'm like i'm not they're all getting up to leave i was like i'm not fucking leaving this is yeah this is the end of the movie i'm not definitely not leaving true story they sat out there in the car with her mom until i finished the movie instead (laughs) of just sitting there and finishing the movie so i saw the end of the movie i'm surprised her name her name was jen i'm surprised jen's mom didn't leave me because and she was pissed she yeah. was so pissed and i'm sitting there and i'm like it's I mean, not you came to see this movie like why like, I, I was like i'm not gonna leave and like the the climax of the film like that's just stupid i was like leave my ass i don't give yeah. a fuck you know but yeah, it was jen's mom it, yeah jen's mom just anyway i i i ended up you know going home and 
just digesting that. And then the world's not enough on N64 came out. And I remember thinking, Oh my God, here yep. we go again. Yep. And the game was good. It just wasn't golden eye, no. you know, like it wasn't, but it was still enjoyable, but it, they, they like, I feel like they played with the equation too much. If they would have like laid it out just like they did with Golden Knight, I think it would have been a better game. Like everything looked pretty much the same. It was the same kind of like, you know, platform. Mm-hmm. But it there was a lot of changes as far as like the missions. There it wasn't as long. I remember being like, that's it, you know, and the online play wasn't that exciting. So right. It was kind of a mess at that point with the game. Yeah. So let's move on from the game. So now I want to hear Goldeneye. So you and I have had this conversation all the time. I mean, like I said, I have a whole nother video about this watch, the Goldeneye watch that you and I are both wearing. I mean, this film, not only did it introduce me to Bond, but it, it changed my life in a lot of different ways. I mean, it created an obsession with watches. It created an obsession with James Bond with Pierce Brosnan with all kinds of shit. So with with Goldeneye, what what do you think is it about Goldeneye, especially for people our age, like mid to low thirties? Um, what is it about Goldeneye that was so captivating? I think it was the aspect of community and like friendship and like just sharing that with your buddies and and and, it, and for me moving across the country, it was a way for me to to make new friends, you know, and have something in common. So I think with the game particularly, that was like the the thing that like really was the factor for me. But then right. as far as the style and, and Pierce and, and the sartorial things, that was just self-discovery at that point. So it was like, it was a combination of things. You're looking at, you're discovering like mannerisms through Bond as you know a young child that you're like wow this guy like really is the man right. you know and then you're you're seeing like he has all the toys he has you know he gets the girl and then there's the whole fact of oh wow i have friends that enjoy this too so you're making right. friends through enjoying this so i think there's a lot of positive reinforcement coming from a lot of areas yeah so when it comes to your experience with golden eye the film what are your like what's well, starting with this when you think of Goldeneye when someone's like oh I'm gonna watch Goldeneye what's the first scene that comes to your head what's like that pivotal Goldeneye scene for you oh I I always think about the damn jump like the whole yeah. opening sequence is like immediately where my brain goes um it's funny because over time like and watching it so many times I enjoy different aspects of the film now that I didn't before and it, it basically came down to looking at it from different angles and just my evolution of fandom just kind of evolving and, and kind of realizing all these like moments that I didn't realize, like I'm driving the Aston Martin. I didn't, I, as a kid, I didn't pick up on that. I didn't understand. Oh, yeah. I was like, Oh, Neither it's a fancy I. car. Because that I didn't Ferrari, realize, yeah. to this day, that Ferrari is like one of my favorite cars of all time. Yeah. And it just, I don't know. There was a lot of things I missed, like that I didn't realize um i did enjoy the fact like i never i i can say that like when i was younger i didn't really understand the yanis aspect of the movie i just knew mm-hmm. he, was, he was an agent and now he's a bad guy but i didn't understand what yanis was i didn't understand why he was doing it i just knew like his parents were betrayed by by britain and i didn't understand what it was that they betrayed him but now you know as an adult obviously i get that but it's just, it's one of those films where it's like, it meant something to you as a kid. And then as an adult, you just understand it completely differently than you, you did as a child. Right. So your appreciation is very, the, your perspective on the film is just very different. Right. So what about casting? How did you feel now as an adult looking back on that? Um, do you like everybody cast? Do you think anybody could have been changed? I mean, I know uh, as far as, I think I don't think I would change really any casting me personally. I don't think I change any. And then of course, as you get older, you start to hear stories about why certain people were cast. Um, Mm -hmm. But for you, I mean, is there any, anything that you would change or, you know, even if you could change, like you could take somebody from one of the later bond or one of the later Brazen films and put them in as a different character. Would you change anything? Not in golden. I, I feel like, Goldeneye was cast really well 
I, I, I don't think there's someone in particular. I was like, Oh, that person's gotta go. You know, right. I, I, there's no one that sticks out like that. Yeah. That like Sean, like of. Sean Bean. I think Sean Bean was trying to be bond at some point. And they were like, well, I think you'd make a good villain. I mean, and I think he's, to me, still one of my favorites. He is and definitely. He's my, fantastic. Yeah. He's fantastic. He's and great. And the thing about Sean Bean is, you know, you kind of see this in like reverse with Timothy Dalton. It's like reverse. You see Dalton play a villain a lot mm -hmm. um, in other films. And then as Bond, he's, you know, I've struggled with believability sometimes just because I know he's, I've seen him as a villain. Like, I think the issue with that for me is I've seen him as a villain before I had seen him as Bond and I like can't shake it. But the first time I saw Sean Bean was as a villain. And then when I see him in other things, it just shows how good of an actor he is. You know what I mean? Because I yeah. um, he doesn't just come off as he should be a villain at all times. And then, um, of course, now with, uh, of course, now I can't think of his name. The guy who plays Boris. What is it? Why can't I think of his oh, name? Oh, Alan Cummings. Alan Cummings. I, I read something that he was like suicidal or something before they cast him. Did you hear that? Yes, I think I heard that somewhere. Yeah. Like he was like not getting parts and he was just like completely rock bottom and then landed this and that completely changed the trajectory, tra 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 trajectory of his career. You know what I mean? It's, but these are things you don't understand as a kid. You're just like, Boris is annoying as shit. Yeah. You know what I mean? So um, with that said, as far as the Bond women, are these, where does Xenia rank? And where does Natalia rank? We'll just, we'll just go with the Brosnan films. Are they two of your favorites, least favorites? Where would you rank those two? Uh, Famke Jansen, I love her. She's great. Mm -hmm. I love her as Xenia. Natalia, uh, she's all right. I, I think she's good looking. I, I just, I don't think I'm a fan of her hair in that movie so she's she's gotten even more beautiful with age number yes. one number two i as a kid short hair i was like you cannot as an adult yeah. i don't mind it as much she's grown right. on me as an adult but yes as a kid i'm like this is just not attractive to me <laughs> I know. A shallow I... piece of shit kid <laughs> <laughs> i don't know like it, it wasn't like she was horrible it wasn't like i didn't like her i, I just she was different and and there's nothing wrong with that and i don't know like it, it just if if i had to be super nitpicky she'd be the one i point the finger at however in golden eye the game which i think this might stem from that she's super annoying in the game uh -huh. so i'm wondering if that is where that yes. stems from and it just like kind of drives my my she factor is. yeah so <laughs> no hard feelings towards her as a person or or as an actress i just i think that there's some some recessed memories from natalia just being I mean, like annoying you, in the game you just saying that immediately gave me a headache because i think of all the times you're trying to get her to like either follow you closely or like an untrain when or she'll get killed down you're yeah. like yeah she'll get killed yeah. you're like trying to like push forward and she gets killed and you're like dude Natalia pain in the ass i actually just played it and beat it on the computer and i'll tell you that's a bitch that is a real <laughs> bitch. Um, so, is it? Oh, yeah, because you got to use like WASD and all that to aim and everything. It's terrible. So oh. back, to the, back to, the, uh, to the film. So when you're a kid watching this, what aspect of Bond stood out to you most from Goldeneye? Is it like him getting the girls? Is it the style? Is it the guns? Is it just the courageousness? What what aspect of Bond are you like? This is I'm just so extremely drawn to this character. Um, I think it was just I think it was his personality. I was really drawn to like how he handled situations. Yeah, he was very just everything with purpose. Like when he throws the guy down the stairs on the boat, and like wipes his head with a towel. It's just like it's oh yeah, so smooth. Yeah, so smooth. You know, and then just. Uh, I don't know. Pierce just came across as badass. I, I think that's ultimately what it kind of what it boils down to. Yeah, he um, you know, the thing about Pierce Brosnan and and this is it kind of led to my obsession with this watch. And I don't want to harp on it too much because like I've said about four times now, I have a whole video dedicated to the watch, so I don't need to harp on the watch. But his whole style was impeccable. The guy, Pierce Brosnan himself, is just 
handsome man. But, you know, I just the casting, he was just meant to play that character, I thought. You know, and yeah, even as a I kid, agree. and I think that's probably why when Daniel Craig was cast, there was such an uproar. Um, it's just, you know, Brosnan just did it mm -hmm. so well, and he just embodied the character so well. He he rode that fine line between being a badass and being, you know, the ultimate gentleman. Um, but yeah, I mean, just, you know, I just remember like n needing the watch, needing to have the watch and needing to be as cool as him. And, but then at the same time, there was parts of the film because you're so young, like you said, especially like with the DB5, you don't even like, you have, you have no, no idea. idea the history behind some of the or, things. Or the PBK, you, you still don't understand right. like the right. whole story behind that. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think the DB5 is is probably the ultimate example. And you hit the nail on the head with that, with with something in that film that as a kid, you just don't appreciate because we're talking. She pulls Zenia pulls up. She's wearing all red in this red Ferrari, this coupe Ferrari. And it's truly to this day, a dream car of mine. I just thought that car for that time period is so incredibly well done. And yeah. You know, next to the DB5, it the DB5 looks bigger and wider, and it's actually probably not wider, but just curvier and all. And you just see like, you know, 40, 50 years or what? It's what? How many years difference of cars? Like 40, 50, right? 40, mid 40 to 50 years worth of difference in cars. And, but you don't realize the history behind it. Where now it's like you see a Daniel Craig film, the DB5's in it, and then they got like, you know, some concept Aston Martin, you still kind of can't take your eyes off the DB5, which as a kid, you're just like, get this. I mean, there's champagne in there. That's cool. I can't even drink. <laughs> like, I don't What's that? Is that apple cider? What is that? <laughs> How does he got ice in his car? Isn't his arm <laughs> freezing? What, the <laughs> um, what, what else about GoldenEye in this, in this time frame? If you, if you go back and watch it, you and Cassandra sit down, you watch GoldenEye. What is it about the film that still makes it so watchable to you? And has it gotten more watchable or less, if that makes any sense? Um, I, I think it's very timeless. It, mm -hmm. I mean, there are things in it that make it dated, but right. from just the storytelling aspect of it, I think it's just a well-rounded Bond film. If I was to show my kids a Bond film, that would probably be one of the first ones I would gravitate towards because I think it's a good starting point. Right. Um, I, 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 I'll be honest. I am not a big fan of older movies. I'm trying to like get that itch. I have to be in a mindset to like sit down and watch something that is older or black and white. Granted, um, I have seen every Bond film, uh, but the, I, I'll be honest. There are some that I just, you know, I. I Which know ones? it's a Bond film. Uh, I don't know off the top of my head. I, I probably uh, you only live twice is probably one of them where I struggle to watch. Yeah. Um. I just I need. It's just in its era, but I can appreciate that these are you know stamps of time, you know on you know in film, but I have to be prepared for certain films to like kind of like be engaged, and I'm hoping. You know, by the time I have kids and stuff, they're old enough to watch this stuff and understand it. It, it won't feel like that for them to watch a Goldeneye, you right. know. Right. But you're really, it to me, it's just it's a well balanced Bond film, you know, and it's Pierce's first one, and I think he was excellent in it. Uh huh. Do you think it was his best? <sighs> That's very debatable. I I really liked Smart Never Dies a lot. I I feel like him as bond in that film is his best as james bond mm -hmm. i think he has everything figured out in that one it's like his you know Swan that's song. like his mvp movie yeah you know do you think um, the story's better in tomorrow never dies in golden Eye? no i think golden Eye has a better story but the way he portrays bond in that film he has more confidence he he looks amazing mm -hmm. he he just nails everything like it's just I think it's when you get into the like the villain, the villain isn't as strong. So if Goldeneye would have been Pierce's second film, I think it would have been his, it would have been like without a shadow of a doubt, the best film ever right? that he ever did. Um, it's really hard not to pick Goldeneye. Uh, I'll yeah. be honest. Like I, I, there's just certain aspects I love about Tomorrow Never Dies that I think he nails. 
Yeah. And, you know, and the world's not enough is good, but I felt like in that film, there was, he was having to carry the script a little bit with his acting, uh-huh. you know, and then die another day is just, it, we, we all know what it is. I mean, the, the CGI is what hurts that film the most. And, and the craziness of the, the toys and gadgets and, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. so. I mean, so we've talked about this before. And we actually just kind of talked about this on the, the podcast that we just released. But, you know, GoldenEye, it made me obsessed with Barazin and with Bond. But it was the scene in Tomorrow Never Dies when they're gearing up for their mission and he sees all the watches, you know, he, she pushes yeah. that button and all these gadgets, like as a kid and as a Bond fan, like as a kid, just period. But then as a Bond fan, as a kid or adult, seeing like a wall of guns and watches and mm-hmm. like to me, you know, yes, I'm obsessed with with the golden eye watch, which is why I went and got it. And it was the first Omega I got, but it's the scene in tomorrow never dies when he grabs the tomorrow never dies Omega and he holds it. And what does he say? This looks familiar. Or I I remember this or something like that. He says, this looks familiar. And then she goes, we've made improvements. He's like, have you indeed? And then he like sets it. Yeah. Yeah. So when, but just the way he's holding like the emphasis on it, where it is, you know, even when he takes the P99, and he does yeah, like that the, part that part, part was crazy for me yeah you know like that it you know it's it's hard for me to you know i don't know anytime anybody brings up tomorrow never dies i just immediately want to watch it well you're saying it right now and i'm wanting to go back and watch it yeah <laughs> should we just put it on and make this like a four-hour video and we can yeah just, have it like we'll up just in the commentary like a dual <laughs> commentary during yeah so yeah and it's funny because tomorrow never dies is what made me fall in love with the omega watch like when he uses it to detonate you know the glass breaker on the on the jar it Mm -hmm. it was the way the leds on the face of the dial like lit up is what was like oh yeah drew my attention i was like holy shit i need one of those and then the obsession began yeah and then it was furthered by you know going into the jewelry store and connie like pulling it out of the case for me and letting me put it on and ask questions. And right. yeah, it was um, definitely a catalyst for me to be head the direction I did. And, and granted, I wouldn't get one for another. Let's see. That was 97, 98. It was 10, 10 years, years right? until, yeah. until I got my first one. And it wasn't even that one. And the funny thing is to complete my collection, I finished with the golden eye watch mm-hmm. and it was funny because when I got the automatic, which was the one worn in Tomorrow Never Dies, I felt like this nostalgia. I was like, oh, this is the Vaughn watch. Like, right. I was like, this is crazy. But when I got the Golden Eye watch, it was so different. Like, yeah. it was more different than I, I, it was very different than I thought I was, I was going to feel about it, you know? I think, you, great- especially with what your interest is and, you know, with your page and everything, I think it's just the sheer, it's it's like just the basic feeling of this is like the watch. This was the first. This ever is the beginning. Omega Bond watch. And granted, I didn't get the t- the the um, tritium version. Which, if I come across one, I'll get it. But it, it's not a. To me, it wasn't that big of a deal. It's still the same movement. So yes, one aspect of it is not exactly screen accurate who cares? Uh-huh. <laughs> like, like at the end of the day, I'm just like, not that worried about it. Um, I, th- I think I love the quartz movement more than I thought I was going to. Mm-hmm. I mean, even like wearing it right now, there's something nostalgic about it. When I look down and it ticks, I'm like, Oh, I just get yeah. all these vibes of golden eye. And I think about like, it's truly a bond moment. Yeah. Well, I mean, me. it's like you of all people know quartz first automatic, there's this huge debate and there's, you know, ones more expensive ones, this, that, but it's like it is an omega at the same time. You know what I mean? So yeah, quartz or automatic, regardless, it's still going to be an incredibly high functioning watch. You know what I mean? It's yeah. not like you're like, oh, it's just this huge downgrade. Like when I look at it, to me, it's like they ch- they chose quartz at that time because I think that was what was in and that was the thing. And then they mm-hmm. moved to automatic for the next film. But it's like it was the best of the best at the time. You know what I mean? And and here yeah, we are. And like we're talking this watch is what now? Twenty what seven years old or something? Yeah. 
you know? Yeah. So, I mean, nobody would ever, ever, and I'm talking style, quality, function, movement, nobody would ever be like, how old is that watch? 30 years old? Well, here's Absolutely. the funny thing. In three more years, this will be considered considered a vintage piece by Omega, you know, yeah. 30 years. So it's crazy to think that, you know, this is like, you know, and for as long as this watch was around, how many people bought this watch? Because mm -hmm. it was the Bond watch, you know, and it was in so featured in so many Bond films. So like they're, it's, it is crazy to think about with how things are now, you know, every film we get like one to three watches, depending right. on, you know, what's going on. And, you know, a part of me misses that like, oh, this is the Bond watch and it's for a period of time. But also you got to remember when Pierce was doing his films, it was like every two years he was pumping out a film. Daniels were like four, you know, four to five years apart sometimes, you know, so I... I'm okay with them switching the watches up and it gives, you know, something new to look forward to, but there is a piece of me that does love that, that essentially Pierce had one watch outside right. of the movement, you right. know, when it comes to, cause Goldeneye is not a very gadget laden film either. So once you've seen, I mean, like compared to some, especially the old ones, like the old ones, it's like, I think there's, I mean, I think there's more gadget in it, gadgets in it than, than like the Daniel Craig early films. Oh are. yeah, I'm not even Daniel yeah. Craig aside because Daniel, you can't to me, you can't even compare the Daniel Craig's. But I'm talking like you know, for as since you're a kid, I mean, if Tomorrow Never Dies was really your, your Brosnan film, especially with like the gadget, just the wall of gadgets is just incredible. Like we talked about, did you wish there was more in Goldeneye? Uh, no, because you had the watch laser, you had the watch, the, the, the mines that were connected to the watch, you had yeah. the exploding pen. Do you prefer you know, the way the laser comes out in Goldeneye? No, I actually like it better on, uh, on Die Another Day. Yeah. And too. the reason being is because it's more practical that way. Yeah. yeah. I feel like it's shooting out of the top. It's, I don't know, the angle's kind of weird. Yeah. And Maybe that's why it's so damn difficult in, in the game. <laughs> yeah, it, it's and it's not like like in the game they have like on his wrist and he's like doing it, and in the movie he takes it off and uses it. Right. But in Tomorrow Never Dies, he like uses it kind of like a sandwich and it shoots yeah. out of the crown, and I think that's more of like to me that's more realistic. Yeah. Because you got to think like if you're if you're using it, you want it you want the laser to be flat. You want to be able to like aim aim it like a certain way. So I feel like when it shoots out of the top, it's kind of the angle wouldn't make sense. No, no, you know. So that's just my this is me being super nerdy and like no. I mean, I agree with that. Details it just, of it. it. Just if you were to, if you were to look at a watch, even if you were to just show like we'll say Brienne because Cassandra would probably answer the question correctly. Brienne <laughs> would be a more of a difficult task. If you were to show Brienne the watch, be like if if I were to tell you a laser came out of this watch, where would it be? She'd, she'd probably say the crown because it, it comes to a point like it just yeah it just makes the most sense exactly so uh i always prefer that one and it just uh, to me it would make more sense because then yeah. you're taking it off to use it so i mean yeah the theme song for goldeneye i love it it's to me it's one of the best it, and it's it, because at first of a long I... drawn out beginning at first I, I hated incredible. it and now I just love it. Whenever I hear it, it, it's like it's almost like you get those Shirley Bassey vibes from it. Uh, Tina Turner kills it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So I mean, at this point in time, you know, now now that you're an adult, you've got a completely different viewpoint of these older films. Do you feel um it, it just like cinematography wise soundtrack wise direction wise like would you change any aspect of that for gold knight yeah i can't stand the soundtrack yeah, yeah soundtrack, I, I, I don't like it either it's terrible um it's like er it's, eric it's, sarah it's not fucked, noticeable eric sarah was making that that the the music about him instead of making it about bond and I know they redid the tank scene last minute to make it more Bond. And to me, that's the best song in the whole soundtrack. Yeah. Which it's not even included in anywhere. Like you can't even like, I'm sure somewhere on the internet, you can find a version of it, but 
It wasn't on the soundtrack on the DVD, or I mean on the on the CD. It's not downloadable. I haven't seen him put it on anything else. So it's like, that's the most Bond sounding song in the whole movie. And it wasn't even done by, by the composer that, that composed all the soundtrack for the rest of the film. Right. And I yeah. know they like picked him out because of the work he did on Leon, the professional. And he was like kind of the hot hand at the time. Yeah. But that guy just, <clears throat> he, he shitted up that soundtrack. Like, like uh, that's the only gripe I have about it. And if, if David Arnold would have done that film, it would have been perfect. Uh huh. So this is Barbara Broccoli's first as a as the you know executive producer, from what I understand too. I know it's not mm-hmm. Michael G. Wilson, Michael G. Wilson's, but it's Barbara's. And Martin Campbell. I mean, you and I have talked about Martin Campbell all the time. He, I did. You feel like he got to do enough Bond um, because his two Bonds are two of the best films period to me you know what i mean i would love to see him come back for the next one just like yeah. anytime they have a reboot just let him take the helm that would be unprecedented if he did this next bond film and he got to do it with a third actor i, I think know. it would just be I know. amazing what is it what is it with martin campbell let's this will be a good question what is it with him and getting the first at bat with these actors in their first films and then isn't back for the next one and I, I know I, he's probably the type of director, kind of like Sam Mendes, where Sam Mendes was really reluctant to do Spectre because I know he was very happy with Skyfall. He's one of those, like, it's not a paycheck thing. It's not a status thing. He's like, I made this movie. It was phenomenal. I think it's like a critically acclaimed piece and I can move on and do a play or whatever the fuck he wants to do. Um, what is it with Martin Campbell in these, in these like, you know, I think, I think first, for him, it, first films? It, I think for him, they're, the slate's clean. The expectation is just like we want a Bond film, so right. he can kind of mold it how he wants. And then after the fact, it's like, okay, well, the standard's been set. It's like I don't want to have to, you know, it, it's so much harder to follow up a great act, you know, with the second one. And and it's okay. I think uh, uh, with with Casino Royale, let's be honest. He had, he had the best film to do. And I think what brought him back to that wasn't only the fact that Daniel was doing it, but it was like, Oh, this is the bond film you want to do. Like it's the first book, you know, um, golden eye obviously was his first one. So like it was his first crack at it. Uh, I think him coming back would be, have to be the right situation. Right. I think that's what it really boils down to. So do you feel like trying to figure out the right way to word this? So, I mean, Goldeneye is arguably Rosin's best. I mean, of the three. Got another day. You can just... But I mean, Casino Royale, Casino Royale for a lot of people, I mean, there's debate whether it's a true Bond film, whatever. I mean, it's just that movie, it, it's just unspeakably good. It really, yeah. really is. Do you feel like it's a script thing for him, or is it more so like it's a new actor in a clean slate? Because the I think, Goldeneye I think script isn't as good as the Casino Royale script, like not even close. I think it's a, I think it's a clean slate thing. Yeah, I, I think for him it's okay. I got a new actor. I can mold them however I want. There's no, there's no history here where he's going to say, you know, I'm going to get a lot of pushback. And you got to think like these new actors when they roll in, you know, play Bond, their eyes are like bright eyed and they're just kind of like looking right. for direction instead of like, well, that's not how we do it you right. know like or this is this is how we've done it you know so i think there's a lot of that kind of in 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 martin's head when he's he's doing these and then okay so then my last martin campbell question why do you think they turn to him after for casino royale like because you know i mean tomorrow never dies mm-hmm. you and i've had this conversation too a lot of things as you guys can tell we talk about all this shit tomorrow never dies is a good film the world, yeah. never, the world is not enough is not the worst film I've ever seen. It's not that bad. I mean, no, each it's not film horrible. is missing things. Each, you know, and I, arguably you could say Goldeneye is lacking in some sense, you know, with certain things, soundtrack being one of them. Why is it that, you know, 10 years goes by and they literally cast a new actor. He's completely different than any actor they've ever had people are all pissed off about him being bond and they're like we're gonna we're gonna call martin campbell and it's not like a hey barbara can i direct this this seems interesting they chose him 
as they did with Goldeneye. Why, why go back to Martin Campbell? So I think because of the fact that so much was riding on Goldeneye being in such a hiatus for six years before they made that film, there was an immense amount of pressure to deliver a great film. And Martin handled it with such grace and, and he delivered on, on, you know, the promise of making a good film. And so this time around, it's like, Hey, we got a new actor. There's a lot of pushback. This is a man who's been in the seat who has, has helmed a film like this before with this much pressure and has knocked it out of the park. What's, what's to say he can't do it again with just a different actor and voila, there you go. You right. know, I think it's really as simple as that. If he would have said, no, I'm trust me, they would have found someone, but, I think for the producers, it really brings a level of comfort knowing that, hey, this is someone we've worked with. We had a great experience. And not only that, he knows how to handle this situation. So I, I think it was just more or less like, why wouldn't we go with Martin Campbell instead of this is we should go with Martin Campbell, you know? Yeah. It's interesting to me, too, because it's not like he's he hasn't done anything is as good as Bond in his career. I mean, he directed Green Lantern, which is considered one of the worst movies ever. And that's obviously not his fault. But in between Bond and Bond, he did like both Zoros and like two or three other movies that are not anything, you know, I think they were all box office successes in the sense where they made money, but they mm -hmm. weren't like blockbuster. You know, they, they really had no sense of he's kind of, tailed off or anything between Golden Knight and Casino Royale. Like they really had a lot of faith in Martin Campbell. Maybe it's just because in their opinion, he understands Bond mm -hmm. and what Bond is supposed to represent and what, what their interpretation of Bond on screen is supposed to look like. Yeah. So, I mean, it could just be as simple as we just like his style, you know? Yeah. So hypothetically they bring him back for the new actor and say he is younger say he's the youngest one they've ever had say he's like 30 28 something right. like that um do they go back to martin campbell can he can he really I, do it if again? i was a gambling man i wouldn't i wouldn't rule it out i'll say that i wouldn't yeah. rule it out but I, I have a feeling that they're gonna try to woo carrie fukunaga back again i think I he'd do it. it i really think he would do it Oh, I think it would too, because it would be different, you know, like he did, he did no time to die with Daniel, but now it would be like, okay, here's your chance to start fresh. You know, here's your chance to do a film where you have more creative control, you know, versus, yeah. you know, and that's fine. Like either way, it'll work. For, like, I just want to make sure that there's a director in the chair that wants to be there that's the most important thing oh, and that, yeah. that will yeah. work well with the actors and has a good vision you know i thought for all the things i bitch about about no time to die carrie fukunaga's uh finger or uh fingerprints are all over this film like like the way it's filmed the the concepts in there i mean it looks amazing um the angles he shot for the film are amazing i i don't have any gripes with that it, it's honestly it's a great film it's just not i i just not a fan of the ending and the, right. that's okay <clears throat> yeah you know? so for the last question of the video last goal my question um this one's this one's going to be probably like a two-parter but we know that one of the big reasons they moved to daniel craig and to casino royale was the Bourne film so right. Warren comes out, it's super low budget. Matt Damon's still not the biggest actor in the world yet. And it does what it does in the fashion that it does. So, and I had just explained this to Brianne the other day. I was like, this, this film is basically why Daniel Craig is Bond. It's like, you know, it's not big budget. It's not over the top. And yet it's incredible. Right. Do you think that GoldenEye was the closest to a Bourne film of everything before Daniel Craig, like literally Dr. No all the way to die another day. I can't even put the two of those, but do you think GoldenEye was the closest, like realistic bond spy tale up until this point? It might be difficult to compare to the old ones, but you know, when you can tell Casino ones, Royale or, or not including Casino Royale, nothing Daniel Craig is included in that question. 
And you're saying closest to born. And, and what I mean by that is closest to like every aspect of the story you could buy. Like this could actually happen to a British secret agent. You could actually see him doing every one of these things. Hmm. I'm trying to think. So here, I'll give you a little context. The reason I, I no, asked, I'm just trying to think if there's something else, like because that question's yeah. kind of pointed. I just well, here uh, the reason I ask is because I just watched the Born Identity a couple days ago, literally mm-hmm. three days ago or something. And when I watch it, because being such an avid Bond fan, you always root for Bond over any other film. Like Mission Impossible comes out, I'm like, I still like Bond. Kingsman, I still like Bond. This, I still like Bond. Whatever. And it's like as I'm watching Born, I, I'm sitting there thinking, I'm like, you know, is there a Bond movie pre Craig that is completely viable? You know, completely as realistic as a Born film would be. You know, and I'm talking from story to, you know, I mean, you never have to necessarily count like, you know, the the money in the cars because that's not always the case. But story wise. Um, villain wise like villains objective you know it's just like i'm kind of watching it like is this is this better than most bond films in this aspect i mean it's just really tough because born was like such a different direction at, right. at that time and you gotta think like 90s films like every film i'm thinking of right now the saint i'm thinking of um mission impossible one and two mm-hmm. like it was just a different era of film, like the way they did action movies, like even yeah. true lies can be in the conversation. And I just, I don't know. I think it was just such a huge transition shift of how films were being made that there, it, it was kind of groundbreaking what they did with born. Yeah. You know, it, it, well, it's really hard. Like maybe the score, but that's not really a spy movie. That's more of a, you know, a thief movie. Yeah. So I don't know. Like it, it's a tough yeah. question, right? I mean, and, and yeah. I think another reason I ask is because you could argue that, of course, is still excluding Craig. The Dalton movies were the darkest of the franchise up until. Oh, Craig. yeah. So when you think of born films, the realism and the grittiness, you just immediately think it's like a more dark, realistic spy tale. And when you when you're leading into Goldeneye with Dalton films, like, is there just kind of like a leftover darkness that you kind of can't avoid, which makes it similar to a Bourne film? I would like say Dan Rather with these questions. <laughs> I would say um, License to Kill is probably the closest thing to Bourne in, in the pre, pre-Bourne era. Yeah. Like that, that's without a shadow of a doubt, like probably the closest because you got the cartel aspect, you have you know, murder, uh, you know, of a married couple, you have main characters dying. Like, like it was like, that is the closest I feel like you can get before anything after born came onto the scene. Yeah. And look at, look at the reaction that film got, you know, it was ahead of its time. It really was because oh, yeah. if you look at that film yeah. now, it's not a bond film. It doesn't feel like a bond film, but I think it's, it holds up a lot better now than it did back then. Oh, yeah. And if I'm not mistaken, wasn't Scarface like not very, I mean, it was, yeah, I guess it was, it was more critically received than audience received, if I remember correctly. Like, I know the critics liked it because of the performances, but the audience. Yeah, it was, it was, it was a very, very dark film. You know, Scarface is a very dark film, you know, but it's just a completely different, different animal. Yeah, but You're I'm saying at. some of the themes with, you know, the cartels and the drugs and, you know, Cuba and all these things, that's like kind of comparison of the two. Very like Vice City. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think there's a lot of influence from Miami Vice in there, you know, big 80s show. Yeah. 70s show. I don't know. I never watched it. I just know Don Johnson was in it and he drove a white Ferrari. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. It, it's almost like they took that that. um that concept and that's where bad, bad boys was born you know right right but it I, I mean they're born has definitely changed the direction but i think we're going to get a shift again i think we're in an era where we're going to get a shift 
in how the films are being made. I think people have had enough of the, okay, let's have this Dark Knight slash Batman begins tone slash Born Identity tone. And let's right. get a little bit, let's add a little bit more of the escapism into it. So that's why, and I've said this numerous times on our podcast, that's why I believe like what Tom Cruise and Kevin McCourt, oh, what's his name? Not Kevin McCourt. Uh, McQuarrie, what's his first name? The director for um, for uh, the Mission franchise. That what they're doing is is it's working. They have found the perfect balance of like action, storytelling, and just escapism. It's it, trust me, there is so much unbelievable shit in in, in Mission Impossible, but it's the Chris, way it's being, Christopher. Christopher, that's right, Christopher McQuarrie. Um, that's what's making it work. Is the, it's fresh, it's it's fun, but there's still a story to be told there. And I think the other thing is, is Tom Cruise is surrounding himself with a great supporting cast in his storytelling, and I feel like that's important. You know, right. do you think you would be anywhere near as Bond fanatical if Goldeneye sixty four didn't exist? I think I eventually would have found my way to Bond just based on my my film taste and stuff. Um, I just don't think it would have happened when it did. Yeah. I think it would have came later on. I think, and and who knows to what degree it would have been. I I I like to think that there are certain things of Bond that I I like more now, other than what I originally started with, mm -hmm. and. It's just like, I, I think when we did that episode with David, when we talked about like, you know, the mannerisms, I, I know he talked about emulation a lot. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you're a teenager, you're very, you're very influenced by like the things around you that are going on, you know, whether it's your friends, whether it's social media, like whatever it is, you are picking up notes from these things, whether you, you're meaning to or not. And that influences you going forward. And it's just, I feel like when you get into your twenties, you start going through the, the, the act of this is who I want to be. And you start figuring out, you know, what you want to be. And then when you get to your thirties, it's almost like, okay, this is who I'm, I am. You know, you're accepting that this is, this is the type of person, I, how I want to carry myself. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, the approach, you know, it, it just, I think we all like need, role models and we all need guidance and we all need influence and we all need you know to find our own identity you know and use it however we want to use it but for me i like dressing nice i like and but i also understand like putting on a, a hooded t-shirt or, or a t-shirt and a hoodie and jeans and you know just slumming it like i it, it really does affect like who you are you just got to always remember at the end of the day this is just a fictional character Right. you take from it what you want to take from it and i like i like taking the aspects of making me a more gentlemanly like that's honestly like what i enjoy about bond is just the way he carries himself like it's just like he's this ultimate like gentleman and like i want people i want to feel respected like bond is portrayed in the films like he is you know he he carries himself with you know disdain and and like people he his presence is felt when he enters a room right and i'm not saying i need to be the center of attention but i think it's more or less i want to feel confident when i walk in a room and i feel good in my own skin and right. I'm, I'm showing up with my best self i couldn't agree with you more guy couldn't agree with you more well, thanks for doing this with me man i appreciate it hey anytime brother i i love this um I'm sure you're going to like add little clips in here and videos and pictures and stuff. And yeah. I, I'm excited to see it. So yeah. Anytime and you also, want to jump on. You got a new channel now. I do. Let's make I sure do. we shout that out. I meant to shout that out at the beginning, but you know, if, if people watch this whole thing, they're true fans. They're you know true I mean? fans. <laughs> but yeah. So tell everybody about your new channel real quick. Yeah. So I am now on the YouTube scene. I'm doing Omega Bond watches on YouTube. And I think like uh, what I'm trying to convey in my intro is, is that, yes, I'm going to cover the watches. I'm going to do content around the Bond watches and, you know, other Omegas and maybe even some Rolexes. Like I want to cover more than I'm currently covering on Instagram, 
but I'm also going to kind of get into some of the other aspects of bond that I enjoy and like clothing's one of them, um, drinks, you know, experiences, things like that. I want to have like a more well-rounded like aspect from my perspective, Mm -hmm. which um, is different from yours is different from, you know, Harris is different from David. I'm just bringing to the table what I enjoy about bond and from my create my creative perspective. So it's going to be interesting because I think a lot of people are like thinking it's going to be this one thing and it's, it it will be that, but there's going to be like so many other aspects to it that I'm excited to kind of explore. Yeah. Take it from me. It's very easy to stray. Once Mm -hmm. you start doing YouTube, it's, you know, it's easy to, uh, to come, you know, it's difficult to come up with, with many ideas, you know, it's because you want them to be good and you want them to, yeah, you, know, you want you want relativity want to, to like play a factor in what you're what you're producing, and I just you know it's stuff like this. It's like talking. It's it's having a discussion around things that you know me and you'll talk about like on the phone, you know, or on Skype. But right, it's not something we do with people that follow our content. So this is a cool way to kind of like bridge that gap. That's right, guy. Well, I'm looking forward to it, and it it is just. Omega Bond watches on YouTube. So search that. I've actually got it in the link in my bio on my Instagram because I'm just that good of a friend. Oh, and you're such uh, a good friend. So, Thank you. Uh, but yeah, thanks for coming on, man. I appreciate it. Thank you guys for watching. And uh, yeah, this has been kind of an ode to Goldeneye and us discussing aspects around it and kind of future and, and past films before it and after. But uh, yeah, thank you guys for watching and I will see you on the next one. Oh, you got to do it before you go. Do what? You got to stand up and pump your arms out. Come on. Like Boris? Yes. No, you can do that.